What will be the enforcement philosophy of the Securities and Exchange Commission in Q4 of 2021 and beyond? How will that dovetail into the new aggressive stance taken by the Department of Justice on white-collar criminals and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? Matt Kelly and I explore those questions and other on this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. First of all, uh, Matt, welcome on what I hope is a cool, beautiful foliage day in Boston. Hello, Tom. Uh, We are getting close to peak foliage here, although we had a very wet uh, summer which actually makes fall foliage push a little bit later into the year. So leaves are starting to turn here, and we had the Boston Marathon today. It was nice to see the marathon in fall foliage because we usually have it in April. Um, But we're expecting to hit our peak maybe in another two weeks or so. Matt, last week you had a blog post entitled More on SEC Penalties Policy Shift, where you talked about a speech from the new head of the Enforcement Division, Gerbeer Gerwal. I was wondering uh, what uh, kind of struck you about this, about his remarks, and why did you think it was significant? Yeah, so um, I thought that Mr. Gerwal's remarks were notable because they broke ground in a couple of ways, and we can talk about that. But his broad point was that he envisions a world where the SEC will be a bit more expansive and aggressive in how it uses its monetary penalties power. Um, And we, Tom, I know you and I have talked about that on this podcast before, that one of the Democratic commissioners on the SEC, Carolyn Crenshaw, she's been saying this for a while Well, I think this is more important now because Carolyn Crenshaw is sketching out these big strategic objectives, and I think compliance officers can stare at those big objectives in the sky and say, okay, that's interesting. But now that we have an actual SEC staffer, the director of the Division of Enforcement, saying essentially the same thing, where Mr. Grewal even quotes some of what Carolyn Crenshaw has said previously about a more aggressive use of penalties— well, when the enforcement director says it, like now it's real because he and his subordinates, they're going to be the ones who are sitting across the table from you when you are trying to negotiate a specific settlement for a specific instance of misconduct. And if he is now saying these same things that we're going to be using penalties more expansively, uh, we are going to be open f- to increasing what the penalties should be in absolute dollars. We're going to be open to increasing them over time if the conduct is not deterred. Um, then suddenly, I think that's much more practical for compliance officers to watch because now it's getting a whole lot closer to the people who are really going to bite your corporation in the rear for misconduct. Well, that's Mr. Grewal and his subordinates, and now he's saying all of this same stuff that the big thinkers have been thinking. So that's why I, it, it caught my eye. Matt, one of the things that uh, maybe I had a little different perspective was the specific topics of penalties. And uh, you seem to think, or at least wrote, that penalties are about deterrence. But from his remarks, it seemed to me that uh, it was almost penalties as punishment. Did, did uh, you see it as punishment, or do you really see a, a, a more robust enforcement as perhaps uh, uh, both punishment and deterrence, or is it really more about deterrence? It really is about both. And what was interesting, I'll start with Caroline Crenshaw and what she has been saying. And she's been very emphatic that monetary penalties are there for a reason, and they are there to punish. Um, And there is a school of thought in the SEC enforcement world that monetary penalties should be small, And we should focus more on disgorgement of ill-gotten profits and maybe some interest uh, in costs or something like that. But beyond that, the penalties only harm the shareholders today. And what is the point of that? Because the misconduct happened years ago with different shareholders. So why should the SEC be punishing shareholders today for misconduct that they weren't responsible for? Now, Caroline Crenshaw does not agree with that idea at all. And she has up front in saying penalties are there to punish. And if you do something really bad, you should get really bad penalties. If you do something that's a little bad, you should get maybe a little penalty, but penalties are there to punish. 
And the more egregious the misconduct, the larger the penalty should be. And if we uh, take that approach across the board, then all investors will know that sooner or later, I'm going to be on the receiving end. I should be paying more attention to this right now. So should the board that who I'm putting on, you know, I'm voting in and proxy v- b- votes or board directors and CEOs should understand. I personally might have a stake in this, my liability. We should take it all seriously. So there's definitely an element there that monetary penalties are there to punish misconduct. And so we can't make dismiss that at all. But second, Tom, and this is something where I think this is interesting, is that Mr. Grewal was talking a lot also about, and penalties have to deter people from making misconduct or committing misconduct. Well, first, who people? It should be the people who are committing the misconduct today that you're going to get a punishment to deter you from doing something like that in the future. And it should be other companies and executives who will be deterred seeing someone else getting taken to the woodshed with a big penalty, the theory being that you're going to sit there and say, there but for the grace of God go I, so I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't want to have that happen to me. Um, So he definitely is saying that penalties also have a deterrence purpose. And what was interesting is that he said, if we are imposing the monetary penalties on a type of misconduct and it keeps on happening, then clearly... The deterrence isn't enough, so the penalties have to be even bigger. And that's where I think compliance officers should maybe sit up and take more diligent notes. I could easily see in this world then that your peer gets fined a $10 million penalty for FCPA misconduct in 2022. You have essentially the same sort of misconduct in 2024, and you get a $30 million penalty. Well, why am I getting three times as much? That's not fair. Because if the deterrent wasn't enough, if some other future company like you committed the same misconduct as that other company that was sanctioned first, you know, they would be able to say, well, clearly our first penalty wasn't big enough. So we're going to make the penalties bigger than the future. And Grual specifically said that. I could even dig it up um, where he said, it may be appropriate for penalties or other remedies to be increased in response to the lack of deterrence. That is a direct quote from his speech. So I would interpret that as we might have some set of monetary penalties right now, but if the misconduct keeps happening, clearly we're not deterring it. The penalties have to be bigger. And that, I think, is the point that compliance officers should take to heart. I think it's a point you should take to your board and your CEO and say, this could happen to us. That's why we need to take these things seriously. Um, And, Tom, we can maybe talk a bit about Justice Department guidance as well, but that also strikes me as very similar and very much in step with what the Justice Department has said about compliance programs, that you're supposed to read the room, compliance officers, and if you see us enforcing against your peers for certain types of misconduct, learn those lessons so you don't do it. And here's Mr. Grewal saying, If you don't do it, maybe we're going to have even bigger penalties in the future. Now, he's an SEC enforcer as opposed to justice, but I don't think these two agencies are out of step with each other at all. Come on. Um, I think that it's a point that we have to take to heart. Uh, Before we get to the DOJ, there's a couple of enforcement actions by the SEC I wanted to to put out there because it would seem that uh, they're uh, pretty good examples of what you see and what Mr. Grewal and, indeed, Commissioner Crenshaw talked about, and that's the first one was the Kraft Heinz uh, enforcement action earlier this summer of $62 million. And the second is the WPP FCPA enforcement action from uh, September. And uh, for those uh, who haven't read Matt's post yet, uh, the money line from his post is, quote, even tut-tutted a $62 million penalty against Kraft Heinz end quote, but maybe take those two penalties and and use those to maybe describe what Commissioner Crenshaw sees as as something, if not a failure, lacking, and how maybe the WPP enforcement action either portends or points towards uh, a a higher uh, amount of fine or penalty uh, when warranted by the conduct of the company in question. 
Well, I'll take each enforcement action separately, and I'll start with Kraft. So Kraft was fined $62 million, uh, and the, it, the misconduct in question was that Kraft had a bogus cost-cutting scheme where they violated accounting rules to project the idea that their expenses were lower, so therefore their net income was higher. And they wound up paying $62 million for what was a pretty clear and egregious abuse of uh, accounting fraud, basically. That's what it was. Um, But what Caroline Crenshaw was faulting there was that a lot of companies bury misconduct bad news amid other bad news, and then, so let's say you announce, we're going to have a terrible quarter, sales were off, and uh, we don't know when it's going to get better, and by the way, we're also under investigation by the SEC. And your market share, or your market price, your share price drops from $30 to $20. Well, how much of that $10 decline was due to you saying, we had a terrible quarter, and we don't know when it's going to turn around, and how much of it was due to Oh, and we have an SEC probe into accounting fraud. It's hard to know, but that decline in the share price is instrumental in figuring out, well, what was the harm to investors? Because they were misled about something. Well, what were they misled about? And a lot of people would say, you can't easily disentangle that, and we don't know. And Caroline Crenshaw just waves all of that aside and says, basically, who cares If you are committing accounting fraud, you're committing accounting fraud, and that's wrong, and that's really wrong, so you should get a monetary penalty no matter what. And trying to disentangle various bits of bad news to find out the harm to investors from the misconduct bad news, like, why bother? Just judge the misconduct on its own. And so that was Ms. Crenshaw's big beef with the Heinz Craft uh, enforcement action. I actually think the WPP enforcement action, which happened just a couple of weeks ago, this might be even more on point with what we're talking about here, where WPP ignored whistleblower complaints from some internal employee about uh, FCPA violations overseas, where they ignored the whistleblower complaints for two years, where this whistleblower sent six or seven complaints of increasing specificity where the whistleblower was saying, it's this person in our company who is kicking back bribes to this executive here in India, and here's how they're doing it. And red flags just ignored over and over and over. And as a result, the the, uh, $19 million settlement that WPP had to pay, more than 40% of it, 8 million out of the 19, was a monetary penalty. Now, that's, that's a large percentage tied up. So I think that gets to the point here is that the absolute dollars involved in the FCPA scheme for WPP, it wasn't a lot of money, but the penalties involved were substantial there as a part of the total. Um, and what gets to me is that, okay, we are supposed to be deterring something that's bad, like what? Like ignoring red flags. And Tom, how often have you and I talked about FCPA enforcement actions where the company ignored internal warnings and red flags. How often have we talked about a case where that was part of it? I, I couldn't even begin to recount them, probably all of them. But what's the sort of uh, behaviors that the, FC, that the SEC would want to deter? And if it's not working, the penalties are going to get bigger and bigger. Ignoring red flags. Uh, weak accounting controls over, say, false books and records, because, Tom, it's always a false spreadsheet somewhere, and then there's the real spreadsheet with the good stuff somewhere else. That's another one. You know, we're going to see things like that. So what WPP had had done struck me as exactly the sort of misconduct that you want to deter, and, and we're not deterring it, because, Tom, you and I have been talking about it all the time. So one must therefore say, well, okay, then maybe the penalties aren't big enough, so let's jack them up even more. I could easily see that being the sort of thing that we're going to see more of in the future. Matt, now let's turn to the Department of Justice, because we also had some remarks by John Carlin last week, and uh, he also talked about uh, perhaps renewed vigor on FCPA enforcement. But as you know, the Department of Justice uh, FCPA corporate enforcement policy begins with if a company self-discloses, there's a presumption of a declination. Uh, so one, do any of these discussions sort of change that presumption? Uh, 
number one. And number two, does it give uh, companies, compliance officers, or boards of directors pause that uh, if to, to get the presumption we have to self-disclose, but if we self-disclose and our con- conduct is either egregious or recidivist in nature, uh, are we looking at an increased penalty uh, when before perhaps we would not have? So I think the best short answer to all of these questions, Tom, which are very good, uh, is that we don't know. I, I don't know. You don't know. We could game it out. But what, what do we actually know here? Nothing. You know, we are reading too many tea leaves that I would caution us for. Now, I do think that uh, Mr. Carlin's speech the other day, okay, A, it's welcome. B, that said, he didn't really say anything you wouldn't expect a new uh, deputy associate AG. I think that's his title there. But um, you wouldn't expect him to say anything other than we are going to be serious and recommit and redouble our efforts to fight corporate fraud. Uh, that's great, and we should, but you know, what else were you going to stand up and say? We're going to just half-ass it for the rest of the four years? That was never going to be in the cards, nor should it ever have been. Um, my, I think I would like somebody, Mr. Carlin or somebody else in the fraud section maybe, to give a speech talking about the same kind of issues that Mr. Gruwal is talking about on the SEC side. We need some clarity from the Justice Department on this. Um, because it is true that you would get a declination to prosecute unless, back me up on what all of the considerations are here, but unless senior executives were involved or unless it was especially egregious or unless you are a repeat offender, but that ties very closely to what uh, Mr. Gruwal was saying from the SEC, they want to deter future instances of misconduct. And Tom, I've been beefing about this for a couple of years now, so... What happens when we have somebody who has gone through the FCPA corporate enforcement policy once, who then is a repeat offender? I would say, by definition, you can't qualify for a declination then because you didn't have an effective compliance program. Because when you went through it the first time, you're supposed to have an effective program by the time it ended. If you then had a repeat offense, well, then you no longer had an effective compliance program. So, right, so, But now, like, we're we're you know, sketching things out on a whiteboard, and who knows? What we really need is more guidance from the SEC, from the Justice Department, I'm sorry. We need more guidance from the Justice Department about questions just like this. I still think the corporate enforcement policy is a good common sense thing. I still think that deferred or non-prosecution agreements are going to be the vehicle of choice to resolve corporate misconduct cases. Um, because the alternative is the Justice Department is actually going to prosecute these things, and suddenly then that gets much more complicated for both sides who just want to put this matter behind us. But if you actually start taking more cases to trial, well, you're taking cases to trial, and who knows what a judge or a jury might do, and the corporations are going to defend themselves to the hilt because a guilty verdict or a criminal indictment against the company has huge repercussions that you cannot buy your way out of, Um, If you get indicted, you might be able to not be able to trade on a stock exchange. You might not be able to participate in government spending programs. You have big problems. So a company does not want that. I don't think the Justice Department wants it. Um, So I still think like the DPA, NPA, declination to prosecute, those things, that's still going to be going forward. But there is this business here about what are we going to do with penalties against companies for misconduct, especially repeat offenders or other companies that are doing exactly the same thing that some other company did last year where you're not taking the lessons to heart? How are the Justice Department going to handle this? The SEC is starting to show its cards. Tom, I just I would like the Justice Department maybe to revisit all of this and show us their cards once again or something like that. Matt, there was one other thing in the remarks of Mr. Carlin around DPAs and NPAs that struck me, and it comes to us from Dylan Tokar's reporting in the Risk and Compliance Journal, and he uh, Carlin was talking about the uh, DPAs and NPAs. And that then he said, quote, we need to make sure those who get the benefit of such an arrangement comply with their responsibility. And that struck me as perhaps a, an open question of will we see a, a re, revigored 
or more vigorous use of independent integrity monitors. That was not something that was favored under the uh, Trump administration, and, and we saw very few monitors. But could we see an additional level of scrutiny from the Department of Justice and even perhaps the SEC by putting a monitor in place that makes sure or monitors companies complying with either a deferred prosecution or a non-prosecution agreement? I think that is much more likely than any sort of wholesale revisiting of the FCPA enforcement policy. I could see a revisiting of the compliance monitor policy, yes. And Tom, what you're sketching out, like logically it makes sense for the Justice Department. I know it's a buzzkill for compliance officers because nobody likes getting a monitor. But nonetheless, the Justice Department, I think, does not want to be seen by its critics, and there are plenty of them, who say you're not enforcing enough because companies keep making the same mistakes or doing the same misconduct over and over. Something must be going wrong. Um, So how would you remedy that? Well, you would remedy it by maybe implanting more monitors who can then make sure that the compliance program is working. Well, I would also then ask what happens when the DPA or the monitorship expires. Sooner or later it will. And I have heard more than a few cases where the company says, great, the corporate integrity agreement is now done. The monitor's gone home. We're going to disband the compliance department. I know companies that have done this. I have talked to the compliance officers who have lost their jobs because of it. So how do we continue that momentum at some point you're going to reach that where the DPA is over, the monitor's gone home, and how do we make sure that everything continues in motion? I don't have a good answer for that. I would love it if the Justice Department did. I don't know that they have it either. Um, And, you know, actually, Tom, one other point I wanted to circle back to about penalties and the FCPA enforcement policy. Uh, You would have a declination to prosecute, and all you had to do then would maybe disgorge ill-gotten profits plus interest. So this question about penalties wouldn't necessarily apply because you can't have a declination to prosecute with disgorgement and interest and also penalties. I don't think that can exist. Um, So maybe penalties aren't going to happen with that, and then we still get back to, but if we aren't deterring misconduct enough and penalties should be larger, well, If they're zero because you're getting the declination, but they need to be larger, that means you can't get the declination? Like, this is what I meant before, where the Justice Department needs to talk about this, because you and I are now sketching out these logical games on a whiteboard or on a podcast here, and we're going way, way out on limbs that I'm not entirely comfortable with yet. But the Justice Department, I think, would do us all a big favor if they just made a statement or granted a speech or they can join you and I in a podcast for all I care, I think it would be a great conversation. But the compliance officers and corporate legal departments need more clarity in how all of this is going to fit together. Matt, I guess the last thing that strikes me is uh, uh, kind of laying it out the way you did in your blog post. And as we talk through this on the podcast, it's really uh, uh, to be showing a clear progression, starting really with Caroline Crenshaw and her broader policy remarks, then uh, the uh, head of the enforcement division, uh, Mr. Grewal, uh, with his more specific uh, enforcement thoughts. Uh, certainly, uh, John Carlin uh, did talk in broad strokes about uh, enforcement of the Department of Justice's portion of the FCPA. And if we got that kind of next step where we had a little more, I hate to use this phrase, but into the weeds uh, discussion from the Department of of Justice, I think we could draw a clearer path. But it seems to me we are moving inexorably uh, in a a more uh, robust enforcement direction. Would that be a fair assessment in your opinion? We'll be right back to hear Matt's answer after this word from our sponsor. Look, 2020 has proven to be the year of many things, and the same for 2022. But if you're a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 
401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts. You get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. If you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to this podcast, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com backslash compliance. That's gusto.com backslash compliance. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. I do think that, and if I can throw in one more agency here as a parting example, uh, we have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is now under the leadership of Rohit Chopra, who was just confirmed uh, a week or two ago. I mean, he's for real. He is going to tie the industry. If you're regulated by the CFPB, he's going to tie you in a knot if you get in front of him. Um, And he has been very outspoken about holding directors and officers accountable for misconduct. I can't imagine he's not also saying, oh, yeah, sure, and we should hold companies uh, responsible too. I'm sure he's for that, but he has been talking about uh, directors and officers being held personally accountable. And Tom, as much as we're talking about corporate penalties, I could easily see that attitude seeping into enforcement against individual executives, and he seems gung-ho to really use his penalty power, but it gets back to, if the same misconduct is happening over and over, then we're not sending enough of a deterrence message, so the penalties have to be larger. That's exactly, almost word for word, what SEC, um, the enforcement director Grual said at the SEC. That idea, I think that's going to transfer into a lot of different agencies with civil enforcement power, and you should watch that. And it also could translate into the Justice Department and the Criminal Division. I would love us to have a speech from the Justice Department on that too, but this basic idea, this is not going to go away at all anytime soon. Well, Matt, that seems like a great way to end this podcast. I certainly think this is something that we're going to get to visit on again on Compliance Into the Weeds. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I'm going to link to Matt's blog post in our show notes, so check that out for additional information. I'd also like to tell you about the latest addition to the Compliance Podcast Network, Design Thinking in Compliance, where with my co-host Karsten Tams, we take a look at the social engineering tool of design thinking and how it can create greater efficiency and effectiveness in your compliance program. So check out Design Thinking in Compliance. It posts every other Wednesday. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.